things to do. Do it with your might. For there's no record device in the grave where you go in. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might. For in the grave where you go in, there's neither knowledge, there's no device. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might. For there's no record device in the grave where you go in. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might. For in the grave where you go in, there's neither knowledge. There's no device. Show love to your husband, your wife, and your children. Today is the day. Don't wait for tomorrow. Tomorrow may never be yours. Give all you have. Show them you care. Today is the day. For in the grave where you go in. There's no more loving, there's no more care. Honor your father, your mother in the Lord. Today is the day. Don't wait for tomorrow. Because tomorrow may never be yours. Obey every word and you make them glad. Today is the day for in the grave. Where you go in, there's no more honor, there's no respect. Come, let us sing and give praise to the King. Today is the day. Don't wait for tomorrow, because tomorrow may never be yours. Lifting your voice, singing or sun. Today is the day for in the grave where you go in. There's no more worship and no more praise. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might. For there's no way or device in the grave where you go in. What? Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might. For in the grave where you go in, there's neither knowledge, there's no device. Tenzi, Tenzi, Odi, 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 Shave it up, shave it up, 
Tumari and Dione, Dino than Dione, Dione, Cunyang, Cunyang, Timio, the charamba, and the chisheveza, sheveza, Kutimari and the oni, the no dandione, the one, Kunyangwe, Di chasi muta izwira gukwamuri tenzi tenzi di di one sa di one muni ka ine di ma si chenge te. Good day to you. How many of us are happy to be back again? Ah, praise God, praise God. We'll carry on with our usual tradition. Look at your neighbor again and say, neighbor, don't give up. Neighbor, don't give up. Ah, amen. All right, before we carry on with the song service, we shall close our eyes and pray. Let us pray. Our kind and loving Father, we thank you, Lord, for guiding us. We thank you for all the wonderful messages that we have been receiving in this place from the throne of grace. We ask that you continue to guide us even today. Help us in all that we do. May we continue to learn May we continue to invite our friends and relatives. Help us, Lord, to prioritize the kingdom of heaven. For we have asked and prayed in Jesus' name. Amen. We shall make use of our first song, 430. 430. Okay, I see the one that is being beamed. Okay. Okay, shall we gather at the river? That's fine. We can make use of that as well. Shall we gather at the river? Shall we gather at the river? Where bright angel feet have trod With its crystal tide forever Flowing by the throne of God Yes, we'll gather at the river The beautiful, the beautiful river throne of God. On the 
the beautiful, the beautiful river. Gather with the saints and the river that by the throne of God. Ere we reach the shining river, lay we every burden down. Grace Remember Calvary. Where he may lead me, I will go. For I have learned to trust him so. And I remember twas for me that he
You can go up to heaven by going down on your knees to pray. You can see the face of the Lord when you close your eyes to pray. A sinner on his knees is more powerful than a preacher on his toes. You can conquer all the snares of the devil by going down on your knees to pray. Prayer is the hand that holds the hand of him who holds the whole world in his hand. There is no other way to talk to God. Prayer is the way. When you choose to kneel before God, you can be able to stand anyway. If you choose to humble yourself before God, he will lift you above everyone. A sinner on his knees is more powerful than a preacher on his toes. You can conquer all the snares of the devil by going down on your knees to pray. Pray is the hand that holds the hand of him who holds the whole world in his hand. There is no other way to talk to God. Prayer is the way. Prayer is the hand that holds the hand of him who holds the whole world in his hand. There is no other way to talk to God. Prayer is the way. Prayer is the Papa can do you no good. 
What shall I do? What shall I do? Well, you may hush, 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 hush. Somebody's calling my name. Hush. Somebody's calling my name. Somebody's calling my name, cry, oh my Lord, oh my Lord, what shall I do, what shall I do? At some point, each and every one of us will need to learn sign language in order to be able to communicate with other members of this society. We'll ask the special sign language team to give us a special item of music. Thank you.
I greet you all in the name of Jesus. We want to thank God who has been with us throughout the day and has brought us here safely. It's now time for our um, health talk. I'm not a new face to the health talks. I'm Dr. Matanda, and today I'm presenting on alcohol. Alcohol, the number one public enemy. Right, that one is the basic structure of alcohol, and the example given is of ethanol. The key thing there is the OH, the OH that you see that denotes alcohol, and it is obtained by fermentation of sugars. And alcohol is, is, is glamorized. They, show, they don't show you the end product. They make sure to show you where we are starting, you know. And like every other thing, you see, if someone, um, for example, if you are watching an advert for a um, shop that sells building material, they try to show you the finished nice house so that you'd want to go and buy from them. But with alcohol, it is a different story. They show you the initial product. They don't show you the end product. They make sure always not to show you what you are getting yourself into. And uh, it is given a lot of fame. And they make sure they take the famous people of this world. Even though they don't drink, they are the ones who are used in the adverts. They never take the person who has now been fully affected by alcohol and really show you where you are going. Right, it is the most dangerous drug on earth. Um, alcohol kills five times more people, causes more disease, wastes more money, destroys more families than all other drugs combined. So if you've heard of drugs that kill, including the, all the other drugs that you can think of, Alcohol kills five more times than all of those combined. And you find that even on the other causes of death, alcohol has a hand in that. Half of all fatal automobile accidents can be linked to, to alcohol. And there are some people who tell themselves, ah, if I don't drink, I won't be able to, to drive such a long distance. But that's what alcohol does as we see. Home, as we'll see later, home and work-related accidents... Uh, because of alcohol. Right. Alcohol causes impaired judgment. This is one thing that alcohol does before it does anything else. So even if you take a very little amount, your judgment is affected. That's why they really say don't drink and drive. Even if you drink a very small amount, your judgment is greatly affected. I'm sure there was a time... Some of you might have heard it. There was a time when they were talking about that accident that killed Princess Diana some time ago. And they were saying the driver had alcohol, and even though it was very, very small quantities or not as much as they would expect to cause accidents. But and they discovered that his judgment was, was impaired. I once saw a documentary on that. It causes judgment impairment, right? And then it leads to increased accidents because you, you misjudge. Then you are at a higher risk of, uh, of getting accidents. Right, higher crime rates. Well, that's, you know, someone when they are now sober the next day, they just tell you, I don't even know how I did it. I was drunk. Right, so how does alcohol affect the body? Those are... Uh, picture of different bottles of alcohol. How does alcohol affect the body? Alcohol is a mucosal irritant, which means it, it, we have different linings. Um, the mouth has linings, the, the stomach has lining, the intestines have lining, and alcohol causes irritation of that. And after it causes irritation of the linings, it can lead to ulcers. And because it causes irritation of the lining, for example, of the small intestine, this is where our vitamin B12 is. Um, this is a normal liver that has good cells. Alcohol can make those cells in the liver turn to fat cells. And this is the result. Oh, sorry, this one. Right. So your liver has literally changed from there to there. That's what alcohol can do to you, right? 
alcohol, after it can make this liver to turn to, to fat cells, it can trigger. This liver is the one that makes cholesterol for us. We need cholesterol in our body, but our liver makes all the cholesterol that we need. So there's no need to take any external source of cholesterol because your liver can make as much as you need. So alcohol will make this liver to make even more cholesterol. So while it makes the liver cells tend to fat cells, it makes the liver to make more cholesterol and it instructs the liver to affect your body in such a way that your body stores more fat. That's why people who take alcohol usually have fat around the abdomen. Right? Most people who take alcohol, they will grow tummies. Right? Fat that's deposited around the tummy and we talked about that for, for the previous health talks. Okay, so it can cause, this is liver cirrhosis, then the liver shrinks and becomes very small and it loses its function. Then you can see someone starting to have yellow eyes and sometimes they start scratching, all that can happen. Okay, it also suppresses the bone marrow. The bone marrow is the one that makes a lot of our cells, including the red blood cells as we see there. So alcohol suppresses a function of the, of the bone marrow. And this leads to a weakened immune system. So people who take alcohol, their white cells, their immune system cannot respond as quickly as it is, it is supposed to do in, in normal situations. And they can start having running nose that, that just doesn't stop, or they can start having infections that won't go away. Right. It also leads to high blood pressure. Remember I said alcohol can then make you, your liver make more cholesterol and you store more fat than usual. The fat then can line your blood vessels and then this can lead to high blood pressure and a lot of heart disease that can come from that. There's an increased risk of stroke because of how it affects your blood vessels. So you have an increased risk of stroke. Right, let's look at alcohol in the brain. What does it do to your brain? If you remember the first, uh, I think the first uh, presentation that I did when I talked about, no, it was the second one, when I talked about um, your frontal lobe, saying that your frontal lobe, this is what makes you different from animals like cats and dogs. This is what makes a human being human. And it is that part, the frontal lobe, that's the one that is targeted by alcohol. So it removes all inhibition and it reduces the way you, you it reduces your self-control. Right. Alcohol destroys, it destroys the brain. There are a lot of uh, functions that the brain, brain can do for us, vision, motor functions, emotions. Uh, the part that's will and moral choices, that's the, the frontal lobe. And that's the one that is highly affected by what? By alcohol. But alcohol affects all those, all those centers. They are affected by alcohol, but it mostly affects your frontal lobe and your judgment is very... Uh, is very compromised, right? A healthy front brain controls the life. That's the frontal lobe I'm talking about. It's the one that makes you to reason properly. It's the one that each time Pastor Skid says, I'm appealing to you to think. That's the part that you use to think. That's your frontal lobe, reasoning, judgment. For you to make a judgment and say, okay, I have this evidence from the Bible, and here is a place without any evidence, so what do I follow? For you to make that critical judgment, for you to, to reason properly, you need a normal functioning frontal lobe. That's why you cannot reason with someone who takes alcohol. You really can't reason with them. And if you get into a deal with someone who takes alcohol, and the next day they change, and you are trying to say, okay, you guys, can you listen to this story? This person has changed on me now, uh, but he was drunk yesterday. Everyone will just say, ah, how can you agree with a drunk person? Because we know that their reasoning and their judgment and decision-making is highly affected. Even willpower is highly affected. So even transmission of HIV, you know, people just do risky behavior, and then they easily get HIV when they are, when they are drunk. There's increased incidence of anger, domestic violence, and um, illicit sex or illicit intimacy. You cannot judge between right and wrong. You are just, your judgment is impaired. No matter how much evidence you are presented with, if you have, uh, if you have taken alcohol, your judgment is, is impaired. More illness, like I was trying to uh, explain before. Vitamin and mineral deficiencies, especially vitamin B12, the one that I was talking about, because the lining has been has been destroyed. 
weight gain. You can get about 7 kgs per year. Just 7 kgs that come without any effort if you are taking alcohol. And the fat likes to come and occupy your abdomen. Right? So you start looking like you have a tire around your waist. Right? Okay. Pull away your, your exercising. <laughs> Cancer, you only need three drinks per, per week. Right? Only three drinks, drinks per week. That's about 150 mils of uh, wine and 350 mils of beer. You need just three of those per week to predispose yourself to cancer. Okay, and alcohol in pregnancy. Alcohol just affects the unborn baby. The unborn baby gets mental retardation. Uh, your baby won't have proper brain development. Okay, what about health benefits? There are some people who say, I take wine because red wine is good for my heart. What is actually good for your heart is grape juice, not the alcoholic wine. The part that is beneficial for, for, your, for your heart is not even there in the red wine, but is preserved in the grape juice. So once you start fermenting things and making wine, you lose it. Okay, then there are some people who say, how much, how much can I drink? Oh, sorry. Okay, according to WHO, although regular low to moderate consumption of alcohol is said to be protective against coronary heart disease, other cardiovascular and health risks associated with alcohol do not favor a general recommendation for its use. So basically we are saying zero is always safe. Right. Uh, could you have a drinking problem? This is how you can see if your drinking is affecting your work, your relationships, your health, then you know you are really addictive. And there are some people who can't work without taking a drink in the morning. You know that now you need to look for help. Usually when you are still drinking but are not yet affecting, you can just decide, decide to stop drinking and it will be okay. But when you see your health being affected, relationships are affected, work is affected, you need an eye opener every morning, you can't go to work without taking at least a bottle, then you should look for help as soon as is possible. Nobody wants a drunk pilot, right? Proverbs 20 verse 1, wine is a mocha, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived by this, is not wise. The other face that we have. He gives power to the weak and to those who have no might, he increases strength. So if you need help, you have a, a, a drinking problem, you have a problem with alcohol, please be assured that Christ is there to give you strength to overcome. Look for the necessary help and God is there by your side to give you strength to do anything. After all, he says, without me, you can do nothing. So even if you try to stop by yourself without Christ, you might fail over and over again. Thank you. Good evening, beloved. Nice and warm greeting. Thank you so much. I would like to welcome every one of you to our program this evening. And uh, we meet night after night at 5.30. And we meet in this auditorium in Harare, the Harare International Conference Center. And of course, we meet with our internet family who are viewing and following with us all the proceedings via the internet. And we welcome you too and thank you for being with us. Uh, you know, we live in an age where discouragement can easily set in and people give up. Is that right? And uh, I just want this side of the auditorium, we're going to do it differently today, to encourage this side of the auditorium. Hello? And then I want the upper uh, level of the auditorium to encourage the lower part of the auditorium. All you have to say is don't give up. What must you say? All right, only a little louder than that. All right, let's start with this side. Gear up. Oh, they're probably going to give up. I don't think they heard you loud enough. I'd like you to say it so loud that this side of the room are encouraged and strengthened. Gear up. Ah, oh, you got the message. Gear up. Fantastic, I love that. Now, I'd like all those in the lower levels just to encourage those who are upstairs. Gear up. Some of the sound got caught up somewhere in mid-air. You want to try that just a little louder? Gear up. Don't give up. 
hey, now that you have the message upstairs, why don't you encourage those who are down there as well? Gear up. All right, amen. And that's the message that we share. And one way to not give up is to have others around you encouraging you, strengthening you not to give up. Thank you so much. And I want to give a special thank you to our visitors, especially who've joined us. It may be some of you uh, have not received this little present that we give every night to those who are coming for the first time. Could it be that somebody who's coming for the first time tonight or maybe came in earlier and didn't get this, has not yet received this uh, beautiful little package with a book on health, a CD called Steps to Christ, and a, a card where we'd like to collect information. Please raise your hand if you are in our midst. I see a hand up there. Uh, I see a hand up, and ushers are going to come to you to assist you. I see two hands in that particular corner, and I believe ushers, if you keep your hands up, your, our ushers will come in. I see more hands there and more that side. Please keep your hands up and more at the front. Thank you so much. Keep your hands up. They'll come to you. They'll give you these books. They'll ask you to just quickly complete the cards just so we can know whether you require us to pray for you or with you, whether you desire to have Bible study, whether you want us to come and visit with you. Uh, just whatever you need is all on the card. Just write it down. And our ushers, I see more hands up this side. Uh, I see more hands up this side. The ushers will come in and assist you. And just to let you know, we are so glad you've been coming with us night after night as visitors because this feast was prepared especially with you in mind that we can share with you that which we have and are also benefiting from. Don't think that it's just you benefiting. We who are already your hosts, the Seventh-day Adventists, are also benefiting, but it's, it means so much more that you are with us. I want to let you know that um, uh, we have CDs and DVDs of the sermons that have been preached night after night. You can get them from uh, the landing, from the reception area. Uh, they're going for an amazing and unbelievable price of $1 per DVD. That's an amazing price. It's absolutely low, I believe, and more so with the messages that are in there. Uh, you can buy direct with cash or with a uh, US dollar bond, uh, or you can swipe or use Echo Cash. And for those of you who are watching, you can get them on the internet, or if you really want a hard copy, you can get one using World Remit or Echo Cash and other methods. Thank you for doing that with us. And um, we also have lost and found property. People are bringing in their stuff, but when they leave, they are no longer in each other's company. Right at the reception, uh, you can be reunited and have a sweet reunion with your property. Just check Bibles, keys, a whole lot of stuff, clothes for kids. They've been found there. Please go and check if anything is missing from you. I wanted to check before I invite the chorister. In fact, before I invite the chorister to come forward and lead us through. How many have been enjoying our health talks? How many have been enjoying and benefiting from the health talks that are coming up? Let me see your hands with confidence. What does the church say? Do you know there are people who've been writing us via the internet from uh, all over the world? Somebody wrote uh, this, uh, this morning and said, I've been watching you and I've been thoroughly benefited from the health talks. To let you know again, tomorrow at 1 o'clock, our health team will be sprawling these grounds. There are boots in place. There are tents set up ready to assist you. Bring your family members who are not well. Bring your relatives who want uh, consultation, uh, who want to speak to a doctor, who want to find out how best they can look after their health. All of this is being done at no charge. What does the church say? So come on over. They're there to help you. Last week's attendance, Wednesday and Sunday, were amazing. Come on over. This is the last chance. Well, after that, of course, there's the next Sunday, and then it's over. Doctors will be at your beck and call, and they will not be charging not a penny, not a dime. Right now, I'm going to call upon our chorister, and I'll invite you all to rise to your feet. Let's all rise to our feet as we sing the theme song, Burdens Are Lifted at Calvary.
Heavenly Father, we come before your throne once again. We want to thank you for who you are. Thanking you, Lord, for what you have done for us so far. Bringing us to this stadium night after night. We have come here safe, though the traffic is in problems. We want to thank you for that. And we want to thank you, Heavenly Father, for the messages that we have been hearing. We have been revived, we have been encouraged, we have been helped, Lord, to put you first in our lives. So we pray, Heavenly Father, that you do that again today. Give us listening hearts, listening ears, concentration, Heavenly Father, that we might hear and do. We also want to pray for our visitors here. Give them courage, Lord, to make wise decisions. Decisions that will bring salvation to their families. We also pray, Heavenly Father, for the speaker. Continue to use him mightily, Heavenly Father. We have used him in the past, but today, Heavenly Father, stand by him. May we know that the word that he says comes from the throne above. We also want to pray for the internet family, those that are watching via the internet. Do wonders, Heavenly Father, as we hear people are being baptized, people are choosing you. Continue using us, Heavenly Father. Continue using him. Continue using the committees. Be with us today. May we feel the presence of the Holy Spirit. May we be encouraged, Heavenly Father. We want to thank you, Heavenly Father, because you keep your promises. That way, two or three are gathered, you will be amongst them. Look at this great number, Heavenly Father. And may the Holy Spirit continue to shower us and to comfort us, and to encourage us. And those that once stepped in this auditorium, may they also think about the message that they had and desire to come once more. 
We want to thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayers, for gracing this meeting, for answering our requests. Thank you. We pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Good evening once more, church. Thank you for joining us again. And now we are about to have our main presentation for the evening, the sermon that Pastor Randy Skitt will deliver today as God leads him. And uh, you've noticed that night after night, uh, when he speaks using his uh, voice, uh, there's somebody else who's speaking as well, using their hands and other signals as we go along in their ministry for uh, the special needs community, those who are orally challenged, has done tremendous good. What does the church say? And the young man who's with us uh, doing the signing is a young man, Gerald, and he's been doing mighty, mighty things with the rest of the team. And normally this side of the church has been reserved for our friends who are orally challenged, who have special needs, and they've come in and their feedback is that they've been blessed night after night. In fact, part of the team was out in Bucharest over this last week. They went to Hungary and they tell me they had a splendid time while they were there. What does the church say? And now we enjoy some music, a hymn of meditation from the group The Well, the Well Music Ministry, who will sing to us before the preacher stands up. May you be blessed this evening. Amen. This world of sin is passing through, but a better day is drawing nigh. When the lamp of God, sweet lamp of God, the Holy One will shine on us. He truly comes, He truly comes. To destroy the world, he truly comes, he truly comes, he truly comes to destroy the world, he truly comes. This world of sin is passing through, but the righteous ones shall leave this earth. When the lamp of God, sweet lamp of God, the living one will shine on us. He truly comes, he truly comes to destroy the world. He truly comes, he truly comes, he truly comes. To destroy the world, he truly comes. He truly comes. He truly comes to destroy, destroy the world. He truly comes. He truly comes. He truly comes to destroy, to destroy the world. Hallelujah. He truly comes. He truly comes to destroy the world. He truly comes. He truly comes. He truly comes to destroy the world. He truly comes. He truly comes. He truly comes. He truly comes to destroy the world. He truly comes. He truly comes. He truly comes to destroy the world. He truly 
Faro wangu kukuonai hamasangu. This is a good time to pick up an offering. <laughs> How are you? That's where I say. Nice to see you. You look well. You look well. You always look well. Let's give all the credit for that to God. I'm delighted to see you. Thank you for coming. And for those of our family members watching via the internet, we are similarly delighted that you've joined us, and God is present with you as verily as He is among us in this building. I will never get tired of thanking God for the lofty privilege of speaking for Him. And it is because I value this privilege so highly that I tend to be so direct. I cannot afford to get into a pulpit and waste God's time. I have to tell you exactly what the, the Word says, what the consequences are, what the blessings are, and appeal to you as earnestly as I can that the wisest decision a man or a woman can make is to choose to give the life to God as soon as possible. And so, thanks for coming. God bless you. I love you for loving God and His Word. Who is with us this evening? You are not a Seventh-day Adventist. May I see your hand? That's I. God bless you. 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 I mean that God bless you over here. Ah, God bless you. God bless you. Block that light. Go. Anyone in this set? Ah, God bless you. In the balcony, anyone try to block the light? God bless you. I cannot see because of the light. That's not a complaint, just a description. All right, thanks for coming. God bless you. God is good. And all the time. Psalm 100, verse 5, For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting, and His truth endureth to all generations. God is truth. Christ is truth. The Holy Ghost is truth, according to the Bible. We who are the children of God must also be truth by the way we live our lives. Our subject for this evening, God has preferences. What did I say? God has preferences. When Christ walked this earth, he had 12 disciples always with him. But of the 12, there were three that were closer to him than the other nine. Peter, James, and John. And so, God has preferences. We're told in the new world, those closest to Christ will be those who have given their lives for him and gone through the time of trouble. God has preferences. There are some people, by the way, closer to God than others. And I'll talk about that. Some people are closer to God than others. But tonight, God has what? 
preferences. Before I begin, I always trouble you for three favors. Favor number one, kindly please turn off your phones. I have not heard a phone ring, I don't think, since I began speaking May 8th, and this is May 16th, and I hope that continues for the rest of this series. Thank you for respecting God. Please, phones turned off, Bibles turned on. Let me tell you what happened to me today. I was in the elevator, getting ready to go to speak on the university campus, and I had my Bible in my hand. And I've urged you always walk with the Bible. In the elevator was a very beautiful young lady, nicely dressed, nicely made up. And I just stood there, and I waiting for the elevator to get to my floor. And she said, is that a Bible in your hand? And I said, yes. She said, are you a preacher? I said, yes. She said, I am delighted to meet a preacher. I said, I am also delighted to meet you. Then she said, what church? I said, the Seventh-day Adventist church. She said, my mother was a Seventh-day Adventist. Then she began to sing an Adventist hymn for me. And I joined in as we walked through the lobby on my way out. How did all of that come about? She saw a Bible in my hand. Listen to me. Walk with a Bible in your hand. A phone is not a Bible. If I had been on my phone, she would never have said, are you a preacher? <laughs> God bless. I mean, I thank God for technology. Do not misunderstand me. I have a phone. I have two. An iPad, like everybody else. But this is a Bible. Somebody say amen. Favor number two, while I'm speaking, pray for me and say, Lord, put your words in that man's mouth. That is based on Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 9. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. And favor number three, I want you to do what? Tell me loudly. Think. Based on what Bible verse? Isaiah 1, 18. The first part of that verse says what? Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. To understand God's word, we must engage in honest reasoning. Let's bow our heads. Our Father in heaven, thank you for loving us so much. You sent someone to die, someone equal with yourself. This day God is the only way to measure accurately our love for us, your love for us. You sent someone equal with yourself. What this means, that when someone accepts your son, you love that person as much as you love Jesus. And that is clearly stated in John 17, 23. Thank you for that love, dear God. Now as we bow in your holy, sinless, righteous presence, dear God, we desire to be reverent. Forgive our sins, dear Father. Cleanse us through the blood of your Son and replace our sin with your righteousness. I humble myself before you, dear God. My desire is to lift you up by lifting up Jesus through the truth. Grant me the words. Grant me the attitude, dear God. Grant me meekness and boldness. Bless everyone under the sound of my voice in this building, and those precious souls watching via the internet. Bless them, dear God. Let your son be clearly seen. Let him be heard, not me. I'm just an instrument. Father, if this prayer has pleased you, answer it, I pray, in Jesus' name and for his sake. Let God's people say, Amen and Amen. I have omitted to do something that's very, very urgent, uh, serious, necessary. I would like to pray for all those who are sick. If you're ill, just stand. I'll offer prayer for you. I have no power to heal. The power is God. Let me say that again. I have no power to heal you. The power is God, if he so chooses. If you're sick and you like prayer, stand.
whether the sickness is physical or mental. If you're sick, stand. Let me pray for you and ask God to be merciful to you. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Dear God, the Bible says in Psalm 103, verse 3, Who forgiveth all our iniquities, who healeth all our diseases. Father, standing in your presence are those for whom you sent your son to die. They are sick, varying levels of severity, but they are all sick. I'm asking you today, God, in the name of Jesus Christ, because the Bible says in Matthew 8, 17, himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. Christ took our diseases to the cross. And so in the name of Jesus, whose death covered our illnesses, not just our sins, have mercy on those who are standing. I have told them correctly, Father, I have no power, but you have it. And as it pleases you, dear God, place your healing hand upon them, but also bring to their consciousness, dear God, that the, the reason for sickness is sin, whether it is their sin or just living in a sinful world. And so the reverse of that is obedience to you is the first law of health. Bless them, Father, physically, but let it be a symbol of your readiness to bless them spiritually, I pray. And as you touch them and they realize the healing they have experienced, let that draw them closer to your bosom. I offer this prayer for those standing and those standing by the internet. Do the same for them, I pray. In Jesus' name, let God's believing people say, Amen and Amen. You may sit. Thank you very much. Everyone who came to Christ, he healed when he was on the earth. We serve a God who loves to ease suffering and remove pain and agony. So we thank God for his love. Our subject, God has preferences. Let us go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. We'll read verse 2. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 2. A very strong statement from the Apostle Paul. 1 Corinthians Chapter 2, reading verse 2. Our subject, God has preferences. It's about five minutes to seven. I'll release you by 7.45, hopefully. For I determined not to know anything among you, save what? Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Paul is saying very clearly, my focus, my aim, that which is central in my life, personally and as a public evangelist is the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucify the sacrifice of Christ. Let us go to Galatians chapter 6, the same apostle. We'll read verse 14. Galatians 6 verse 14. God has preferences is our subject for this evening. But God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. We stop there. Paul is saying the only basis for glorying is the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. God forbid, that's a strong statement, that I should glory or boast save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so we have Paul making two strong statements. His focus personally and as a preacher was the sacrifice of Christ. If that is clear, say amen. amen. All right. Having established that, Jesus himself said, the good shepherd giveth his life for his sheep. In John chapter 10, verse 17, Jesus said, therefore doth my father love me because I lay down my life that I might take it again. What he's saying remarkably is that the love the father had for him somehow deepened when he died on Calvary's cross. I must say that again. 
How can God possibly love Jesus anymore? Listen to the words of Christ. Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it again. Now Christ is saying, as I said earlier, because of his voluntary sacrifice of his life, the Father expressed a level of love that had never been seen before. Why? Because of the sacrifice of Christ. And so we have Paul. I determined to know nothing among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified, the sacrifice of Christ. Paul again, but God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, the sacrifice of Christ. Jesus Christ, John 10, 17, therefore doth my Father love me even more because I lay down my life, the sacrifice of Christ again. All right. Let us go to Psalm, no, Mark 12. We've read that passage before. We'll read it again. Mark 12. We have laid the foundation that the sacrifice of Christ was everything to Paul. The sacrifice of Christ touched the Father so much, it unleashed a level of love never seen before by the universe. Almost impossible for the human mind to comprehend that the Father could love Jesus more, but he did by the testimony of Jesus. Amen. Mark 12, reading from verse 28. God has preferences, is our subject. And one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, and perceiving that he answered them well, asked him, which is the first commandment of all? And Jesus answered him, the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like, namely this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. And the scribe said unto him, Well, master, thou hast said the truth. For there is one God, and there is none other but he. Verse 33, And to love him with all the heart, and with all the understanding, and with all the soul, and with all the strength, and to love his neighbor as himself, read with me now, is more than what? All whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. <laughs> to love God, which is to obey God, with all your heart and understanding and soul and strength and might and mind and to love your neighbor as yourself. That's the Ten Commandments. That, the Bible says, is more. It is higher than all burnt offerings and sacrifices combined. Now, this is a scribe speaking. How did Jesus feel about such a bold statement? Verse 34, and when Jesus saw that he answered discreetly, or the Greek can mean wisely or prudently, when Jesus saw the man was right, he said unto him, thou art not far from the kingdom of God. Listen again. Keep in mind the foundation we laid for Paul. Nothing meant more to him than the sacrifice of Christ. For Christ, the Father's love for him deepened when he made that voluntary sacrifice. Yet, we have a scribe saying that to obey God with all your heart and to love your fellow man as yourself is more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices, all of them. Let's look at that a little more closely. Let us go to Psalm 51, the psalm of confession from the lips of David after he had been confronted by Nathan the prophet regarding his double sin of adultery and murder. Psalm 51, they'll read from verse 14. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, thou God of my salvation. 
and my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. O Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. Read 16 with me now. What does it say? For thou what? Desires not, else would I stop. That thing that Paul valued so highly, David said, that's not what God wants. That thing that led the Father to love the Son more deeply, the Bible says, that's not what God wants. For thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou delightest not, finish the verse, in burnt offerings. What does the Bible mean? Let's go to Isaiah 1. We read from verse 11. Our subject, God has preferences. Please remember, favor number two, ask God to put his words in my mouth. What book did I say? What chapter? Reading from what verse? 11. Listen to God. To what purpose? is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me, saith the Lord. Why do you bring these sacrifices? I am full of the burnt offering of rams and the fat of fed beasts, and I delight not in the blood of what? Bulls are of lambs or of he goes. God says, I do not delight. That's not where my emphasis lies. But how can he say that? When he sent his son to die, the ultimate sacrifice. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me, saith the Lord? I am full of the burnt offering of rams and the fat of fed beasts, and I delight not in the blood of bullocks or of lambs or of he goats. I don't want that, says God. Then what does he want? What does he want? If God can say that which was the focus of Paul, that's not really what he wants. And I am trying to choose my words carefully. If that which caused him to love his son even more is not the highest thing that he desires, what does God want? In other words, what is God's preference? Let's go to Psalm, uh, 1 Samuel 15. 1 Samuel 15, we'll read from verse 1. Our subject, God has preferences. 1 Samuel 15, reading from verse 1. Before I begin to read, let's pray again. Dear God, in the name of Jesus, grant me more of your spirit. Grant me clearer expression Grant me, dear God, a humble heart, that the truth may leave me untarnished and heighten the understanding of those who listen. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. 1 Samuel 15, reading from verse 1, Samuel also said unto Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint thee, king over his people, of Israel. Now therefore hearken thou unto the voice of the words of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I remember that which Amalek did to Israel, how he laid wait for him in the way when he came up from Egypt. Amalek, in Exodus 17, attacked the Israelites while they were escaping from Egypt, while they were in the wilderness. And God swore in Exodus 17, 14, that he would blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven because Amalek attacked the Israelites. They were not a professional army. They were escaping slaves. Now, this is hundreds of years later. The Amalekites have not repented. Even though God makes a threat, if you repent, he withdraws the threat. Are you with me? Come on, say amen. If the people in the days of Noah had repented, what would not have happened? 
the flood. If those in Sodom and Gomorrah had listened to Lot's preaching, those cities would not have been burned by fire. When God makes a threat, he means it. But God is so merciful, his threats come with a caveat. If you repent, I withdraw it. Clearly, the Amalekites, after three or four hundred years, had not repented of the cowardly attack on the Israelites escaping Egypt. And God said, now the probation has closed. And he tells Saul, now go and smite Amalek, verse 3, 1 Samuel 15, and utterly destroy all that they have and spare them not. But slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. Kill everything alive. Some people read statements like that in the Bible and they say God is bloodthirsty. No, he's not. Every act of destruction on God's part is an act of mercy. You see, the Bible has a principle. You are punished according to the life you've lived. Behold, I come quickly and my reward is with me to give whom? Every man according as his work shall be. Every man meaning every righteous person, every lost person. The reward is according to the life you've lived. God is proportional. Wicked people who have been very wicked will suffer more in the flames of hell than those who were only slightly wicked but never accepted Christ. When a man decides, I have nothing to do with God, I will never, the best favor God can do for that man is to put him in his grace. Because the longer he lives in that condition, the more he pays in the judgment. Are you following me? And so when God decided to destroy the Amalekites, it was an act of mercy. The longer a hardened sinner lives, the worse it will be for him in the judgment. God is not bloodthirsty. The only blood God wanted was the blood of his son, not yours. He is not bloodthirsty. And so God, through Samuel, told Saul, kill everything of the Amalekites, men, women, children, animals. Wipe them out. We know that Saul did not do that. Verse 8. What does verse 8? And Saul did what? Took Amalek, the king of the Amalekites, of course he was, and he spared him, he took him alive, and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. Verse 9 says the same thing. Verse 10, then the word of the Lord came unto Samuel, saying, It repenteth me, verse 11, that I have set up Saul to be king, for he is turned back from following me, and hath not performed my commandments. Give me one word for that. He disobeyed. Now, let's just focus on the people, the Amalekites. Let's assume there were two million Amalekites. How many of the two million did Saul kill? All except one. What did God say? He hath not performed my commandments. I told the students on campus today, God is not a statistician. For a statistician, 9.6 is what? 10. God does not round off the figures. When God says everything, what does God mean? Everything. This is where a lot of people will be lost. They say you have 10 commandments. I keep nine. That's a passing grade at the University of Zimbabwe. Are you with me? Nine out of ten? No one fails who scores 9 out of 10 except in the University of Salvation. God is a mathematician precise. And so he said, kill all. And of the 2 million that we use as a figure, he saved one. And God said, I regret making that man king. Someone might have said, but father, why are you mad? He killed almost everybody. God said, he disobeyed me. Now let's listen to God's message to Saul through Samuel. Verse 22. Listen to what God tells Saul through Samuel. 
hath the Lord as great delight. Read with me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord. What did Paul say that he, he said, I, I, just, I chose to know nothing but Jesus Christ and him crucified. The sacrifice of Christ was Paul's emphasis. The sacrifice of Christ led the Father to live, love him even more broadly and deeply. Yet, the same God who loved his son even more, if that is possible, tells us through the experience of Samuel and Saul, hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings. What are they? The burnt offering, the peace offering, the meal offering, the sin offering, the trespass offering, the drink offering, and the other minor offerings. Samuel is telling Saul on behalf of God, all of those combined do not mean as much to God as simply obeying, thus saith the Lord. Read with me again, verse 22. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices? Let's pause. Notice the expression, as great delight, meaning he has some delight in sacrifices. That's why he loved his son so much. But it is not as great as the delight he has in obeying the voice of the Lord. If that is clear, somebody say amen. amen. What's our subject? God has preferences. Here are sacrifices. Here is do what I say. Pick one for God. You're too slow. Pick one for God. Do what I say. Why? Listen, Genesis 2, 16, 17. You know it very well. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, he didn't suggest. He didn't advise. He commanded the man saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayst freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. Now, God said thou shalt not eat of it. Don't eat it. So when God says in the day thou eatest, what is God saying? In the day thou disobeyest. Thou shalt surely die. Now, if God wanted Adam to die, he would not have warned him. I'm talking to myself. Amen. Let me say it again. If God wanted Adam to die, he would not have warned him. The fact that God warned Adam shows us where God's preference was. Obey me and you'll never die nor my son. Because Christ is a lamb slain from before the foundation of the world. Listen again. If Adam had obeyed, he would not have died, neither would Christ have died. Let's go back to the words. No, let's finish Samuel. Let's go to verse 23. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness as iniquity and idolatry in 1 Samuel 15, 23. Is it up there? No? You have your Bibles? All right. Reading with me now. For rebellion, come on, is as the sin of witchcraft. Stop. Question for you. How many of you work with the devil? You engage in witchcraft. Nice your hand. You have one honest man. Now, this is a serious bit. One honest man. Mm -hmm. Where's the rest of you who are not quite as honest? Witchcraft is far more widespread than you suspect. Disobedience to God is witchcraft. Here's why. Here's God. Thou shalt surely die. Here's the devil. He shall not surely die. To go against God is to cooperate with the spirit of witchcraft, the devil. Are you with me? Rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. 
deacons, you're working with the devil. What did Jesus say? He that is not with me, finish the words, is against me. Well, if you're against Christ, with whom are you? Satan. So we have church members who've never gone to a witch doctor, but who practice witchcraft. <laughs> Rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness as iniquity and idolatry. Finish that verse now, and I hope you tremble a little bit. Read it. Because thou hast what? Rejected what? Not my word. I always ask you to read with me so you know I'm not pulling a fast one on you. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord. Finish the verse. He hath also, come on, rejected thee from being king. Let me tell you something. No to truth is no to God. It makes no difference how often you physically go to a church building. No to truth is no to God. And there's some of you listening to me in person by the internet. Stop saying no to God. Because God's patience, while it is long, it does not last forever. What did he tell Noah to tell the, the uh, antediluvians? My spirit, come on, shall not always strive with man. God has limits. Let me say it again. With earnestness, brotherly love, when you reject truth, you reject the author of truth, that is God. Amen. When you see clearly the seventh day is the Sabbath and you go back to doing whatever you want to do because it's your tradition, you are saying no to God. Amen. When you learn that tongues biblically should not be spoken the way it is spoken every Sunday morning, and you go back, you are saying no to truth, which is no to God. You don't have to say no to God on every point of teaching. One is enough. Amen. You've seen from the Bible, God's plan is one man, one wife. You want three wives. You're saying no to truth, Amen. and you're saying no to God. Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of ram. Now listen to verse 22 again. Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Listen closely. Behold, to obey is better than what? Sacrifices. It is better than the burnt sacrifice, which was the most fundamental sacrifice. When Noah came out of the ark, he killed some animals, offered burnt offerings. When God told Abraham, sacrifice your son, it was a burnt offering. While it is not mentioned in Acts, uh, Genesis 4, the offering Abel brought must have been a burnt offering. The most fundamental offering in the Bible because it was total giving. That's why Paul says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present yourselves a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God. Amen. To obey is better than the burnt offering, the peace offering, the meal offering, the trespass offering, the sin offering, the drink offering. Obedience is better than the sacrifice of Christ. Amen. I hear you saying, explain. It's not difficult to understand the truth of that statement. Let me repeat it, then I'll explain. Obedience is preferred by God above the sacrifice of Christ. Which is the most remarkable thing that ever happened in the history of the universe. The sacrifice, his human life, his resistance to sin, his voluntary death, his resurrection, all of that. The, most, the greatest event in the history of the universe. Yet, obedience is God's higher preference. Why do I say that? If Adam 
Well, no, let me come at it differently. Let us go to Psalm 111. And I'll come back to what I was about to say. Psalm 111, 7 and 8. 25, 24, after 7. Please say, God, put your words in that man's mouth. Psalm 111, 7 and 8. When you found it, say amen. amen. The works of his hands are what? Verity and judgment. All his commandments are sure. Keep reading verse 8. They stand fast forever and ever and are done in truth and uprightness. The commandments of God are forever and ever. They are a standard of righteousness. They are principles. When Adam and Eve sinned, the principles had to be reduced to laws. Are you with me? Let me explain quickly. 50 miles per hour or 50 kilometers, that's what you use, I believe. That's a law. 50 miles on the road outside Rainbow Towers. 50 miles per hour. 50 kilometers. On the road to Balawayo, 70 kilometers per hour. When I fly back home, it's 600, 800, 900 kilometers an hour. You do 60 miles per hour up there, you come straight down. The speeds vary. Are you with me? The principle remains the same, safety. Is anyone listening to me? Now, before Adam and Eve sinned, the law was really principle, which was love. No mother who loves her child needs a law that says, thou shalt feed thy child. Are you with me? The principle of love tells her, feed the child even at the loss of her life. A converted person does not need a speed limit. Because conversion makes other people's lives more valuable than yours. And so you're thinking of others, their safety, and you manage your speed because you love your neighbor. And so those principles always existed. They stand fast forever and ever. Now, let's look at the relationship between the Father and the Son. From what the Bible tells us, it has always been the Son serving the Father. Not because Jesus, before he came to this earth, was a biological son of God. No, they are equal, but because he's just like the father, he's called son of. Are you with me? James and John were called what? The sons of thunder, but thunder did not father them. Are you with me? But because they're so noisy and quick to fight, they were called what? Sons. So in the Bible, when you're just like someone, you are a son of. Judas is called the son of perdition. By the way, the same title given to the Antichrist. So Christ is the Son of God. He's just like God. But it was the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. Wherever you have this arrangement, you have to have obedience. Are you with me? They're equal in divinity, but this way administratively, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Which means there has always been obedience. Long before there was what? Sacrifice. Now, sacrifice was made necessary by sin, which means that obedience has a longer history, are you with me, than sacrifice, because one day Christ will come, get rid of sin, get rid of sinners, and there will be no more need for a sacrifice. There will be no more need for Savior, but always a need for Creator. And the reason we worship God is that He is creator. And so after sin has been done away with, in a sinless world, the Bible says, and it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another shall all flesh come to worship before me, said the Lord. We have obedience in the sinless world when sacrifices are done. So obedience has an endless history. Sacrifice has a restricted history. If Adam had obeyed, there would have been no need for Calvary. If that's clear, say amen. amen. 
So the Bible says God prefers obedience. Because had obedience been demonstrated, his son would not have had to suffer. God doesn't change. His preference today is simple. Do what I say. Amen. And don't try to substitute obedience with singing and joining the choir. Amen. There are some young people, they come to church because they're in the choir. You, you break up the choir, they don't come anymore. Why were you coming in the first place? to sing. <laughs> no one in the Bible has been saved by singing. Not one. Amen. They've all been saved by the Word. Amen. Are you with me? Amen. A lot of people will sing them way to hell yeah. because we put too much emphasis on singing and not enough on the Word. Amen. You arrange a concert, the whole church comes. Arrange a Bible study, nobody comes. Yeah. But Amen. everybody loves Jesus. <laughs> Obedience. That's what God wants. What's our subject? God has preferences. What's his highest preference? Obedience. Give God what he wants. Every time I disobey, Christ feels the agony. We do not realize the danger of sin. Sin was not an irritation or a pimple on the face of God. Sin was a threat to the very existence of the kingdom of God. Sin represents everything that is opposite to what God has in mind for the universe. That's why Jesus had to die because Adam committed one sin. I need to explain. Christ didn't die because the Sodomites were so immoral. He had to die from the instant Adam committed one little sin, eating a banana or whatever it was. All the other sins since then did not make his sacrifice any more necessary. He had to die because of that one sin. Let me say it differently. If no one after Adam had sinned, Christ still had to die. <coughs> One sin. And what's the antidote for sin? Obedience. But since we're sinners, and the obedience is to a divine standard, we need divine Sin has given to us a nature that hates what God prefers. Are you listening to me? Sin has bequeathed to us, given to us, passed down from Adam. By the way, Adam was not the first person with a sinful nature. The devil was. So Jesus can tell the Pharisees, ye are of your father, the devil. That nature has given us a mind with which we are born that is naturally opposed to God's law. Naturally resists what God prefers. No sinner naturally serves God. No sinner naturally goes in search of God. But as it is written, there is none righteous, no not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. That is why Jesus told Zacchaeus, the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost because no sinner out of a sinful nature seeks God. The nature of the carnal nature is to avoid God. Amen. Tonight, somebody needs to say, Father, I want to obey you. I want to give you what you prefer. And not give you a list of options. God wants obedience. Let us look at Genesis and Revelation 
and see what are the two bookends between which the whole Bible is placed. Two bookends. Listen to Genesis 2, 16, 17. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. He broke that commandment not to eat. Now, that's one bookend. Here's the other bookend. Revelation 22, verse 14. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have a right to the tree of life. Did God throw Adam out from the tree of life? Yes, by disobedience, he lost the right. By obedience through Christ, he gains it back. Somebody say amen. amen. Obedience through Christ. And for 4,000 years, God couldn't find enough people on the earth to demonstrate what true, genuine, 100% obedience was. He sent Jesus, and Jesus says, if he keep my commandments. He shall abide in my love, even as I, not a different way, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. My friends, Hamazangu, obey God, please. If there's an area of your life where you are in open or quiet rebellion against God, that is a suicidal way to live. Amen. Obey God. But since the carnal nature cannot obey, here is what God says he will do. A new heart also will I give you. And a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh. And I will give your heart a soft heart that receives the imprint of the Ten Commandments. Are you with me? Huh? It's like a stamp. God can stamp his law of love and righteousness on the heart. If the heart is stone, he can do that. You have the desire. God does the act. I'm talking to my friends by internet. Lay down this oppositional attitude towards God. It is better never to know God than to know Him, what He stands for, and turn your back. God is a God of love. He is also a God of justice. Let me speak to the parents. Even if you don't want to follow God for yourself. I don't know how this works exactly, but I'll say it. Follow God for the sake of your children. Listen to the Bible. All the commandments which I command thee this day shall ye observe to do. That it may be well with thee and with thy children. Are you with me? It may be well with thee and with thy children. You don't care about you, care about your children. Bring your life into right relationship with God and your children will be blessed. But God wants mother, father, and children. Because he's not willing, what? That any in Zimbabwe should perish. Every person lost will be lost by choice. Every person saved Finish my words. Will be saved by choice. How many of you choose salvation? May I see your right hand? I choose to be saved. Can I see your hand? You mean that? Do you mean that? Say yes or no. Yes. All right. Stand with me. Then I'll make a call. Very simple. So, 25 to 8, something like that. Listen to God. Speaking to you tonight, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, May 16, 2017, that I, God, have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. What does God say as a loving God? Therefore, tell me, choose life. Tonight, God says, choose life. 
A person who chooses life can understand. Romans 6.16, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom you obey, whether of, of obedience unto death, of righteousness unto life. Disobedience unto death, righteousness unto life. Obedience is life. Amen. Disobedience is death. What does Paul say? Romans 7.10 And the commandment which was ordained to life I found to be unto death. It's unto death to the disobedient. But it is life for the obedient. Amen. Stop resisting the call of the Spirit of God to obey Him. Let's pray. Dear God, I can only do so much and my effort is paltry. And that's a statement of fact. Father, you know every night I go to my room, I apologize for preaching badly. Every night. Because that's what I feel. And so I am totally dependent upon you. Yes, what I said was biblical, yes. But Father, I don't direct the Holy Spirit. You do. There are people under the sound of my voice, whether by internet or in person, who need tonight to make a decision to obey God. Now, according to the Bible, is the accepted time. There are people playing with your probationary mercy, God. They're playing with your mercy. God is good, let me take one more day to sin. God is merciful, let me take one more week to be immoral. God is merciful, I have six more months. No father, they have now. While your heads are bowed, your eyes are closed. Someone needs to come and say, Father, this message has reached my heart. I have been putting off a decision to obey you. That is your highest preference. And tonight... I publicly declare, I want to obey my God. Because I have been in rebellion against God, not accidental rebellion, willful rebellion. Tonight, I want to say to my God, I am sorry, and Father, as the Spirit drives me and leads me, I am deciding tonight to give you what you prefer, which is plain and simple obedience. If there is someone who needs to make that commitment, come. I mean you rebelling against God. You're in a relationship that disgraces God, you know it. You're living a life that embarrasses God, you know it. Nobody else does but you and God. Tonight, Father, I have chosen to give you what you prefer. Obedience. Come. I'll wait. Come. Young man, young woman, the past several months, in what direction has your life been heading? Towards heaven or towards hell? Towards life or towards death? Are you aware, perhaps, that you're moving in the wrong direction? Stop that movement. Reverse it by the Spirit of God. Choose to obey God. Please, come. Father, you've given me this day of mercy. Let me take advantage. Here is my life, dear God. I want to obey you. Having heard what you heard tonight, you go back to doing whatever you want to do. Your worship is just noise in the ear of God. Just noise. As Paul says, tinkling cymbal and a sounding brass. Come and say, Father, I have been living in rebellion. I want that to stop. I have come to say publicly, I will give you what you prefer, and that is obedience. And you will help me to obey. Come. Let me tell you something. God will survive sin. You will not. Ah, let me say it again. Eventually, God will survive sin. You will not. Come and say, Father, I have chosen tonight 
to give you what you so desperately prefer, obedience. And you will give me power to obey by giving me a new heart and a new spirit. Come, come, please, my brother, my sister, come. Your decision to obey may mean you've got to break off a relationship. Break it off. What did Jesus say? If thy right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee. Put an end to it. If it's been offending God, come. The gospel is a simple thing. The problem is sin. What's sin? Disobedience to God. What's the opposite of that? Righteousness through Christ, which is obedience to God through Christ. Very, very simple. Come. Father, a public decision to put an end to my rebellious life. I want to obey you. I am your Sunday God. I am your daughter by creation and by the sacrifice of Christ. Come. There's someone standing there and you're, there's a battle in your mind. Come and fight the battle right here. Your knees are knocking. Come. There's someone saying, I wish you would stop saying come. I can't stop. Come. I'm talking to you. Or oh, God is using my apparatus. He is talking to you. You're wishing I would be quiet. God is telling you, come. And when you come, the voice will no longer irritate you. Come. Father, here is a public choice to obey you. I choose spiritual decency through Christ. Come. You know your life is moving in the wrong direction. Stop it before you go too far and you cannot come back. Come. My young brother, my older brother, my young sister, my older sister, come. Every person on earth will influence someone else to be lost or saved. A sinful life will lead someone to hell. A blessed life will lead someone to heaven. You choose. Come. I want to obey God. That's what he prefers. If Adam had obeyed, we would not be in a world of sin and crime and plagues and famine and drought and war and epidemics. What was the problem? Disobedience. What does the Bible say? For as by one man's disobedience... Many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Who is the disobedient man? Adam. Who is the obedient man? Christ. And those of us in Christ who obey through him. 60 seconds, I pray. Somebody else come. Father, here's my life. I'm a young man. My friends are taking me in the wrong direction. Father, I need to stop before I end up in prison. Come. Young lady, my friends are taking me in the wrong direction. I need to stop before I have to leave school and start taking care of a child. Come. 45 seconds. Give God what he prefers. Obedience. He will give you the power to obey by giving you a different spirit, a new heart. 30 seconds. Come. Come. Here I am, God. Help me to obey you. 20 seconds. Come. If you're nine years old, you understood the message, come. Ten seconds. Come. Father, my decision tonight is to obey you. If Adam had obeyed, Christ would not have suffered and bled as he did. Come. 60 seconds up, but I see God's people coming. Quarter to eight. The time I said I'd let you go, clearly I can't. Somebody else. God bless you. Those of you praying that hearts will be softened, God bless you for that. Wherever you are, come, answer the call. Father, I am making a public decision, as public as Calvary was, to obey you, give you what you prefer, obedience. It is the foundation of God's blessings.
foundation of health, foundation of everything, financial security, strong home, strong marriage, obedience. Come. Come. God bless you. God bless you. Come, my lovely sister. Come. God bless anybody else. I'm going to pray. When I finish praying, the names will continue to be taken. Don't leave unless you've given your name. We want to pray over the names and know how to reach you. Let me say it again. I will pray because I need to let God's people go. Don't leave until you've given your name. When you've done that, then you're dismissed. I'm going to pray now. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Dear God, I recommit my life to you for service and because a surrendered life is what you prefer. So I give my life to you all over day, God. Take it. You have a right to it as creator. Take it. You have a right to it as the one who provided salvation through Christ. Lord, in all that I do, help me to glorify your name. Look down on those who've answered the call, Father. Look with mercy, dear God. Some are nervous. Some are afraid. Some are uncertain. All of these are natural reactions, Father. Let them understand that. But they have come. And there's power in making a choice. Now, dear God, keep your word. You're not willing that any should perish. Give them a measure of grace right now where they stand. So that when they leave and they're no longer surrounded by hundreds of believers, they may stand strong in their commitment tonight to obey God. They will meet from opposition to God or with opposition. You strengthen them to withstand that opposition. Father, let their decision inspire someone else to say, I want to obey my God. And Father, for those who are still resisting, for whatever reason, in the name of Jesus Christ, knock louder on the doors of their hearts, dear God, until they say, come in. Father, take this message I've delivered in my weak way. Apply it with increased force to the minds of those who heard in person and by the internet. Let many more decisions be made to obey a God of love who says clearly, if ye love me, obey me. Keep my commandments. Now, Father, as we prepare to leave this blessed place, let an angel go with every single person, God. The devil is waiting to cause accidents and incidents. Rebuke him, Father. If you allow an accident, Spare the life. Bring us back tomorrow, dear God. Let us sleep tonight with angels watching over us. We thank you for the rejoicing in heaven over those who made decisions to walk hand in hand with you. Bless them, I pray again. Now, dear God, bring us back tomorrow to hear your word again. Bless us in this building. Bless your precious people watching and listening by the internet. I offer this prayer from my heart in Jesus' name. Let God's people say, Amen. And amen. God bless you. Don't leave until you've given your names, please. We need your names. Stay where you are. We need those names, please. Very important. God is the God who writes. We want to write your name. Make sure we get your names. God bless you. Let me hear the church say amen one more time. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. May it find a place in our hearts, each one. May it find expression in our lives. And so tonight as we leave, I just want to remind you, one full week has already gone. Less than two remain. Keep inviting your friends. Before you know it, the opportunity will have passed. Don't let it pass without your friends being invited and them coming to hear the word. And just to let you know also, when you come in tomorrow, 
there is a clear distinction, well, not so clear to many of us, even to me, between the hotel and the conference center. Our hosts prefer that we use the doors, the entrances, and indeed all the other facilities, including the ablution, the toilets, that is, and the bathrooms of the conference center only, and that we do not encroach into the hotel side. So if you could remember that tomorrow when you come in, come in the long way, yes, but it's the nearer way actually to come to the conference center. Don't take a shortcut through the hotel lobby and come in here. Don't use the bathrooms that side if you can help it. Use the ones this side. God bless you. We'll have a special item of music to send us on our way from the group, the Well Music Ministry. Amen. I wake up in the morning, I get on my knees. I did learn from the master, he taught me to pray. I read on from the scriptures, the patience of Job. Keep on your faith and live with hope. Jesus is the Redeemer and friend. The only comfort when you feel alone. He will be there when you cry out. Keep on your faith and live with hope. When you get into trouble, lift up your head and look up to the mountains where your help comes from. You surely have a refuge all night, all day. Keep on your faith and live with hope. Jesus is the Redeemer and friend, the only comfort when you feel alone. He will be there when you cry out. Keep on your faith and live with hope. Why don't you trust in him? He's faithful and true. He promised to take us home on his soon return. Oh, don't and never look back. Believe in his word. Keep on your faith and live with hope. Jesus is the Redeemer and friend. The only comfort when you feel alone, He will be there when you cry out. Keep on your faith and live with hope. Jesus is the Redeemer and friend, the only comfort when you feel alone. He will be there when you cry out. Keep on your faith and live with hope. He will be there when you cry out. Keep on your faith and live with hope. He will be there when you cry out. Keep on your faith and live with hope. He will be there when you cry out. Keep on your faith and live with hope. He will be there when you cry out. Keep on your faith and live.
touch.